All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. I'm glad you're with us this morning. Uh, so I'm going to start with something I came across from Emma Curtis Hopkins, one of our teachers, and she wrote this in a series of Bible interpretations she did over a hundred years ago. She said, we can think what we please, and what we please to think will make up our destiny of human experience. So here it is already, this idea emerging into the consciousness of America that our thinking has everything to do with what we start to experience out here in the world around us. She goes on and she says, and I love this term, she says, we draw a congregation of things about us exactly like our mind. You know, so each and every one of us, we have our own congregation. I'm not the only one here with a congregation. We all have a congregation of things that are a reflection of our mind. And so uh, I thought this was kind of fun. From Mark Anthony, he said, But I, unless I think what has happened is an evil, am not... Um, oh, I can't read my own writing. Well, we'll just skip that. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was really good at the time, and then I got so excited writing it down, I can't read it. Oh, my God. Well, anyway, no good comes from thinking anyone or anything else is not good. Why is this so? Well, in, in A Course in Miracles, it talks about a thought leaves not its source. You know, so what you're thinking about someone else is essentially what you're telling the universe, what you believe to be true about you. Oh, my God, this gets so personal, doesn't it? You know, it's like, oh, wow. So the only thing to be rid of is something in my thinking that is really not going to serve me. You know, it seems to me that as we do spiritual work, the more we do spiritual work, you know, there are not new principles. I think people sometimes come to church thinking, he's going to tell me some new spiritual principle today. There are no new spiritual principles. The spiritual principles are thousands of years old. They have not changed in eons. What happens, though, is I believe that we become better and better at working with the principles, and we let go of the stuff that stands between us and a greater expression of these principles. So the only thing to get rid of is something in my thinking. So you know, in, um, in Job, in the book of Job, it says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you. So I was reading that again and again this week, and I thought, wow, that's the science of mind. That right there is the science of mind, or at least a huge component of it, that thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto you. You know, what you say ultimately becomes the law of your life. Um, how many people here are doodlers? You know, when you're sitting there with a paper and a pen, I doodle, I doodle all the time. You know, it, it started out very innocently when I was young, and it's just taken on epic proportions, I noticed. So... Um, I, I came across this, and I thought this was really good. One of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, Francis Hopkins, was a notorious doodler. Yeah. And in 1776, he was toying with the year the 1776. And he came up with adding the years across and came up with 21. Well, out of that, he said, well, why not a 21-gun salute for the presidents? which we also use now at, you know, at military funerals and things like that. And so he submitted this idea to members of Congress who liked it and approved it, and it's been in use ever since. So you still watch your doodles. Yeah, that's my point today. You have to watch your doodles. Uh, or, or not. Or don't. You know what I mean? Think about this, that the discoveries of the world, all of these things that are, that are emerging, that we'd say, oh, this was a great discovery, are actually self-discoveries that we don't create the growing body of knowledge, we're just gaining greater insight into it. That we're just opening up more to see things more completely. So our mind is the, is the bridge between us and the infinite. And we have the capacity to change our thoughts and change our attitudes like that. You know, in the New Testament, it talks about St. Paul in the twinkling of an eye. So no matter how long we have believed something, it can change in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. So we, have, uh, we, we talk about how we are divine beings and that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and everywhere present, and we believe that. But if we don't act like it, you know, what hope is there for, for us to have that be an expression? What hope is there for that to ever show up in the world around us? Now, what I believe is so is that each and every one of us, we are an emanation of, uh, we, are the, we are the light of the world. You know, the great light, there is great light within each and every one of us. Now, 
I realize as soon as I say that, you're thinking, yeah, I know some people, the light is not so great. The light is not so great. But we, we may not be letting it out, right? But that doesn't mean it's not there. We may be hiding it. We may be actively suppressing and covering up that light because maybe we're afraid of it or maybe we're ashamed of it or maybe we don't really know what to do with it. But remember, we are the very activity of God, of spirit, in expression. And there is no place where the light of God you know, is any more present than in us. Now, I think this is an incredible thing because no one is any more privileged to radiate the light than you, than me. And what we teach in the science of mind is the same light that is in you is the light that was in all of the great spiritual beings that have gone before us. It's the same light, right? So it is possible that, you know, that we're maybe making it a little difficult for the spirit of God in us to express that may be why things don't seem to work as well as we think they should. How? How are we doing that? Well, I would say, well, first I have to look at, are we judging ourselves and the world by appearances? This will always get us in trouble, you know, that to judge by appearances, because what do we know? We know that appearances change again and again and again. Hmm? So uh, are we looking at ourselves as our past rather than what we may be? And this is also true for others. When we see other people, do we think of them as soon as we see them as all the things they've ever done wrong and all the mistakes they've ever made? Or do we look at them and say, there is all this God potential in there and it's my job to kind of hold the door open a little bit so maybe some of that will start to come forward. See, see if you've ever grown tomatoes, gardeners, if you've ever grown tomatoes, and I certainly have in, uh, in my garden, uh, it occurred to me that things like the, the stakes that you put in when the tomatoes start to get bigger, the cages, the strings, all of that stuff is to support the growth of the tomatoes. Now, if we don't nurture the tomatoes, the cages and the stakes and the strings and all that stuff, they're meaningless. They're not going to help at all. This is just like our spiritual practice, I believe. The practices are what support our growth. Otherwise, we're just going, without the spiritual practice, we're just having experience after experience after experience, but not really learning anything from it. And we wonder why we keep having the same experiences again and again. Have you done that? I've done that again and again. You know, you date a new person, it's just, it's the same person in a different body. You go to a new job, it's the same job in a different location. You know, because we repeat things because we haven't gained everything we're supposed to gain from them. We haven't gotten all the learning. Now, we don't believe in, in punishment for, for the errors or in, in other, uh, other uh, groups, they say, sins. Uh, we don't believe that we're punished for them, but, but actually by them, you know, that there are consequences, right? The punishment is the inner conflict that we feel, you know, and this leads to stress and pain and disease and lack. And so we say, well, what am I supposed to do when someone upsets me? Anybody here ever said that? recently, like this morning, <laughs> right? Remember, we're always dealing with a spiritual law. And so the idea for us is to stay centered inwardly, to keep your thoughts positive, to keep your thoughts loving. Otherwise, I get to have the upset, the nervousness, the annoyance, the stomach disorder, on and on and on and on. So recently, someone parked halfway, uh, okay, most of the way in front of my garage. And, uh, and I couldn't get in and I couldn't get out. And, uh, and so the, the spiritual significance of this did not escape me. It's like, well, it's my garage, and they should get out of the way, and they should know better, and they should be more courteous, and blah, 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 and that's all this conversation in my head. So yeah, in one sense, I was right. But I also have done enough spiritual work that I really knew I wanted to be happy. Right? And I want to be kind. I don't want to do any damage. You know? But I did have a few minutes of I will not stand for this. You know? And so then I went back into the house and I got a cup of tea and kind of ah, breathe, 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 let go, let go, let go. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You know, uh, and came out and sort of looked at the situation a little more. Then I thought of this old Chinese proverb that you, you can't prevent the birds from flying overhead, but you can determine whether they shall make a nest in your hair. Yeah. Right? And so I was thinking that they were starting to make a little nest in my hair. You know? and, but the point of this is that, that people can annoy us, but it's our thought about them that is actually the problem. It's, 
most of the time, it's not really what people do. It's our thinking about what they do, about what they say, about the look they give us or whatever. See, if we begin by changing that thought, I think we can change the whole experience. See, I believe I can have a demonstration of greater good, greater life, greater love, greater abundance, but not the demonstration and my indignation. And I do love my indignation. I do. So it's, what do I want? Do I want to demonstrate greater good, greater life, greater love, greater abundance? Or do I want to demonstrate more indignation? How dare they? Right? Because one has got to go. And I've got to be the one to choose. So I think our prayer is effective to the degree that it changes us. Right? So I didn't go knock on my neighbor's door and tell him to go inside and have a cup of tea and chill out. You know, I mean, that was mine to do. You know, help me to see this differently, right? Because what we teach is that God is the only power, God's the only activity, and I am not bound by appearances. There is no truth in this world out here. This is all effect, right? So if I dispose of the negative nonsense that comes into my mind immediately, if I don't procrastinate about it, you know, it will not become a poison, right? So we teach one power, one presence, one activity in my life, in your life, and it is God. And so to master the situation means I have to master my own thought. We all know people who are, seem to be so good in every situation. Don't we know those people? That they just seem to roll with life so well that nothing gets them really, really riled. And we seem like, and I go, oh, I aspire to that. I want to be that. You know, because things happen around us and even to us, but the most important thing we teach in the science of mind is what happens within us. Right? So we can't control uh, uh, what happens out here totally, but we can control what happens in here. Right? So in, in, the, in the teachings of the Tao Te Ching, it says that we have to go with the river. You know, um, a toaster, everybody has a toaster, right? Don't you have a toaster on your kitchen counter? A toaster heats up because there is resistance. Don't we get all hot and upset because of resistance? <laughs> and I, oh my God, I'm just like my toaster. All these years of spiritual work and I'm like my toaster. You know? that, but difficult, difficult people in our life or difficult situations provide the resistance for us to grow. You know, I, I, I admit, I like to force things. Yeah, you know, because I want it now. Any time between now and right now is like the perfect time. So if, if, if at all possible, I will use a battering ram to take down the door when the key would have been absolutely sufficient to open it. You know? And so I, I, I see that we are all in a process of getting right with God. We get right in consciousness, and what stands between us and our spiritual unity it has to go. You know? So it says that we should agree with our adversary. When we agree with the adversary, that's non-resistance. You know? I think a lot is accomplished by kind of smiling in a knowing way and nodding. Hmm, hmm, you know, hmm. People say something really outlandish or something that could be really offensive or hurtful and stuff, and just smile a little and nod. Hmm, hmm. Well, I will think about that. Thank you very much, you know, because what. What's the big deal about having to be right? I feel like I've made a career out of it, you know? You know, that it, it takes a big person, I think, to be quiet. It takes a big person in consciousness to say, I made a mistake. It takes a big person in consciousness to not say anything sometimes. You know, realize you and, and the people in your life, the people in my life, we have been drawn together for our own spiritual growth for our growth. It wasn't something wrong in your thinking that brought them into your life. I do not believe that. It was consciousness within you seeking a fuller and greater expression of itself. And so how it's going to express in a greater way is that consciousness within us is going to call forth people in situations where we get to practice in a greater way. Yeah. Have you noticed? Have you noticed how people will show up that we have the opportunity again and again to have an open heart or not, to have an open mind or not, to open our arms or not. See, I am limiting my future due to my present low state of consciousness when, when I'm like, you know, I can't imagine or believe anything better. But, you know, we don't want to be caught with a closed mind, I think. People talk about common sense. And I've been thinking about this, and I think that usually means limitation. 
Yeah, where people are saying, well, you've got to use common sense. It's like, well, then that just means you probably just don't want to do the work. Well, you know, it's common sense that now you're living in the past. Well, common sense dictates that. Com that's, you know, common sense is not very common. You know, that we have to have uncommon sense, uncommon, uh, an uncommon approach, an uncommon vision to commonplace things. You, and, and I know people will say, well, people will take advantage of you, you know, because you know, it, now that, where that comes from is this incredible uh, belief that's in the race consciousness that there is not enough. You know, there's not enough good, there's not enough love, there's not enough time, on and on and on. But you know, I remember years ago, uh, there was like a, a poster and a bumper sticker and a slogan that was very popular, and it was that living well is the best revenge, you know? And I still like that. I still like that because, you know, if you're happy, if you're peaceful, if you're loving, if you're content on the inside, then whatever people do that would in the past have really gotten in there and irritated you, they have no power. Those, thi those things, those experiences have no power. But, you know, when people, um, when people refuse to be, to be loving, when they refuse to be blessing and forgiving and all that stuff, it's like they've made a decision to move into the bitter barn. You know, and when you're in the bitter barn, it's really hard for good stuff to happen in your life. It's just not an attracting energy, you know? So, you know, in the Bible we've read, and we've all heard this, how important it is to turn the other cheek. And so in thinking about that, I think, all right, when somebody does something, when somebody says something, to turn the other cheek, I think what I think that means now is to turn to the other side of your own nature, that part where you were divine, that part where you were bigger than the circumstances, where you cannot be hurt. Turn to that place that knows, you know, everything is okay beyond this. You know, why should we let other people determine how we're going to act? You know, Plato said the unexamined life is not worth living. And, and I sort of take the opposite approach. I think the unlived life is not worth examining. <laughs> You know, that we're frustrated because we know there is a great potential within us to live in an even greater way, right? And that, 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 that is divine. That is absolutely of God. And since each of us, our life is consciousness, a problem means we have somehow crossed a wire, right? That we've become disconnected from our source. So if there's an error in our life, you know, something that continues to irritate us or that doesn't seem to be uh, healed at this present time, error only has the power we give it in our thinking. And so when my enemy, whatever that may be in any given moment, causes me resistance, I, I'm not acting the part of my divinity, right? That somebody, somebody has to be the conscious one. Somebody's got to rise up. Somebody's got to be the bigger spiritual person. And I know, we say, well, why does it always have to be me? Because you thought of it. Because you're in church today. Why not you? Ultimately, it's going to be everybody. You know, and the power that goes with our divinity is only ours when we act the part. I think the light in each of us is bright. I really do. But we have to let it shine. You know, we all have people who... who um, who want us to take it way down. You know, those people who are like, you're just a little too alive for me. Could you deaden up so I could be a little more comfortable? You know, and, and you know, you can, you can never deaden yourself up enough to make other people comfortable. And besides, think about it. You as a spiritual being did not come here to, to be deadened up, right? Maybe this is why zombie shows are so popular now, <laughs> you know? That people see the zombie shows and they say, well, at least I'm not that bad. You know, that we are here to live and be vitally alive and express a lot of God. And I know that looks different for everybody, but there can never be a limit to God and there can never be a limit to us if we get into that God consciousness and stop resisting. Let's pray. So as we begin our time of prayer and spiritual practice, I'm going to start with some words from Emma Curtis Hopkins. And she wrote these words again over 100 years ago. My God is the giver and keeper of the life of all things. He never sends death to anything or anyone. Hearing cannot end. Light cannot fail. Peace is unbroken. Joy is endless. Buoyant vigor is increasing. This is my kind of God. 
And so I accept for each and every one of us today that our kind of God is a God that is absolute love and abundance and joy and wholeness. And that this is the truth about each and every one of us, that not only are we connected with God and these magnificent attributes, but we are connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And so I claim for each and every one of us that where we have resisted, we let go right here, right now. And we go with the river, knowing that our good is ordained by God and that there's nothing outside of us that can ever prevent that or thwart it or limit it in any way. Because the truth is, on the inner plane, each and every one of us is connected to a divine and infinite source. And it is only good. So we include in our prayer today our family members, our friends and loved ones. And just as we've been watching our own thinking and raising our own thinking up, we know this same truth for them, that right where they are, they are surrounded with the light and love of God. That all things in their life are working together for a greater good. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world in which we live. So those circumstances that pull at our attention, we say God is right there as perfect peace, as perfect outcome, as all needs met, as healing. We bless our church, we bless all churches. Synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And I know we're blessed by being together. So with a full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth. That perfect healing for each and every one of us is the order of the day. I say thank you, God, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.